Mexico's National Institute of Migration announced the rescue of more than 7,000 victims of smuggling, trafficking and similar crimes during 2021. The Pan American Health Organization has again praised Cuba's COVID-19 vaccination campaign. Kazakhstan's National Security Committee announced the end of the anti-terrorist operation launched in 14 of the country's 17 regions amid violent destabilization attempts. From the headquarters of Telisa English in Havana, Cuba, this is on the south, and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Mexico, where the National Institute of Migration announced the rescue of more than 7,000 victims of smuggling, trafficking, and similar crimes during 2021. The Institute reported that in coordination with Interpol, three operations were carried out, in which 7,329 victims were rescued last year. The agency added that during 2021, at least 2,100 agents were trained in the identification of victims, while 13,000 verification visits and more than 23,000 inspections were carried out in the country as authorities battled to save lives. Last year, Mexico faced one of the strongest migratory crises in the last 15 years, with record numbers of people seeking to cross its territory to reach the United States, fleeing poverty, violence and conflict in their home countries. The situation is aggravated by the US policy of returning the asylum seekers who make it to the border to Mexico to await decisions on their cases. Harsh criticism has rained down on the Chilean government of President Sebastián Piñera after the granting of a concession for the extraction of lithium to two companies. The Ministry of Mining and the President informed the country that the Chinese company BYD, one of the largest electric vehicle manufacturers in the world, and the Chilean company Servicios y Operaciones Mineras del Norte were awarded the lithium extraction contracts for $61 and $60 million respectively. The decision has been harshly questioned by various sectors of Chilean political life and some members of parliament who withdrew from the chamber session that was to analyse the issue. The government had until January 14th to disclose the awards. President-elect Gabriel Boric expressed his disagreement with the decision of the outgoing government. They have already taken the decision. They have the power to do so. But it seems to me that it is a bad decision, but we will review it in due course with our collaborators. And we maintain our willingness to create a national lithium company that also acts in consideration of the communities, the care of the salt flats, and national productive development. And far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro announced he won't attend the inauguration of, Chilean, of Chile's president-elect Gabriel Boric, scheduled for March 11th. Bolsonaro's decision is motivated by the strong ties that were forged between Boric's coalition and the Brazilian left. Meanwhile, former Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula Silva, who leads all polls ahead of the October presidential election, is expected to attend the inauguration ceremony. Chilean officials reported that the government has been cautious about inviting international leaders to the ceremony, given the spike in Omicron cases. The trial against former Peruvian dictator Alberto Fujimori's son Kenji has begun, who is charged with influence peddling and bribery. The trial surrounds accusations that Kenji tried to buy votes in Congress in 2018 to save then-President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski from an impeachment process. The prosecution is seeking a 12-year prison sentence. Two other former legislators and one of Kenji's advisers are also on trial. Corruption appears to be the norm in the Fujimori family. Alberto Fujimori has been incarcerated since 2007 when he was extradited from Chile and sentenced to 25 years for crimes against humanity and various charges of corruption. Keiko, his eldest daughter and a three-time defeated presidential candidate, is accused of money laundering and obstruction of justice for financing her electoral campaigns with millions of dollars delivered by powerful businessmen. Forty-three percent of Haiti's population suffers from food insecurity, according to a Spanish NGO. Alliance for Solidarity Action Aid reported that, according to its data, there was an increase in migration from the Caribbean country in 2021 as Haitians sought to escape the poor living conditions and violence in their home country. More than a thousand Haitians were sent back to their home country in October alone. Meanwhile, more than 34,000 families received humanitarian aid thanks to the collaboration of the Spanish non-governmental organization, the European Union and the United Nations World Food Programme. According to the United Nations, Haitians' food needs could be covered with some $200 billion.
At least 78 human rights defenders were killed in Colombia in 2021, according to the United Nations Human Rights Office. The organization noted that from January 1st to December 31st, 2021, it received 202 complaints of assassinations of human rights defenders, of which 78 were confirmed, while another 39 are in the process of being verified, and 85 cases are inconclusive. The UN office in Colombia also added that most of the murders were committed in Valle del Cauca, where 31 people were killed, five of them in Cali, the capital of the department, which was the epicentre of the anti-government protests of April 2021, called in the framework of the national strike mobilisations. The multilateral organisation has clarified that the figure does not represent the total number of murders of human rights activists in Colombia, just the cases that have been officially reported and verified. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The Pan American Health Organization has again praised Cuba's COVID-19 vaccination campaign. At a virtual press conference, the director of the regional organization, Carissa Etienne, offered an update on the pandemic situation in the Americas, including the spread of the Omnicom variant, and noted that countries such as Chile, Cuba and Argentina have the highest vaccination rates. The representative praised Cuba's prestigious biotechnology sector, explaining it had developed five different COVID vaccines to date, including Abdallah, Soberana O2 and Soberana Plus, all of which provide upwards of 90% protection against symptomatic COVID when administered in three doses. The country of roughly 11 million remains the only in Latin America and the Caribbean to have produced a homegrown shot against COVID-19. The World Health Organization reported the highest ever number of people infected with coronavirus over a 24-hour period. According to the organization, nearly 3.4 million cases were detected globally. The new daily record came at a time when the Omnicom variant is now widespread. The UN Health Agency emphasised the number of positive cases registered in a single day with the same as in the first four months of the pandemic. Nevertheless, the increasing rate of infection has not majorly affected the death rate statistics. The Omnicom variant, initially identified in South Africa, is present in 58.5% of the tests carried out by the global network of GSAID laboratories. The highest number of confirmed infections reported by the WHO was in the United States, followed by India, Brazil, the United Kingdom and France. On Wednesday, the Venezuelan government confirmed that more than one million children had been vaccinated against COVID-19. Despite the high number and the good pace of vaccination, education and health authorities are working to reach 8 million immunised children and young people in the country as soon as possible. The education minister stated that the process has become more fluid in middle school levels than in others, as there are still certain apprehensions and fears on the part of parents and representatives of younger children. The goal of the ministry is that no child or young person is left unvaccinated. For his part, the Minister of Health explained that authorities are focusing their efforts on convincing mothers, fathers and young people and children themselves of the importance of vaccination, a mission that has had a positive impact in recent days with a significant increase observed in the number of children over two years old who have undergone the vaccination process. Well, yes, this educational complex has one of the almost 7,000 vaccination points that are installed today in the schools and high schools of the country, where we are giving the vaccine to all children over 2 years old and up to 17 years old, with much better acceptance by the high school students, as Minister Yelitsa said, but making an effort and convincing fathers, mothers, representatives of the boys of the safety of the vaccines, of the importance of keeping the children vaccinated, has had a good effect. And the acceptance and increase we saw yesterday and today in vaccination at the national level has really been important. On Wednesday, far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro once again sowed doubts about vaccination against COVID-19, claiming that the Omnicom variant was welcome because it could mean herd immunity and the end of the pandemic, while distorting data by stating that the new wave was not causing any deaths. Omicron hasn't killed anyone. 
the one who died here in Goiás, wasn't from Omicron. In fact, it was with Omicron, it wasn't from Omicron. He already had very serious problems, particularly in his lungs. He ended up passing away. According to some serious experts without links to pharmaceutical companies, Omicron is welcome here and may signal the end of the pandemic. World Health Organization Executive Director Dr. Michael Ryan rejected Bolsonaro's statements downplaying the severity of the pandemic and stressed the importance of vaccination. This is not the time uh, to declare uh, that this is a, a welcome uh, virus. Uh, no virus is welcome that kills people. Um, and especially when that's in, to a great extent, that mortality and that suffering is preventable through the uh, appropriate use of vaccination. So, uh, the African continent has exceeded 10 million confirmed COVID-19 cases as the world enters a third year of the pandemic has entered the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic, the virus has caused great devastation. Millions of lives have been lost and livelihood wiped out. Here in Africa, cumulative case has now exceeded 10 million and more than 230,000 people have sadly. Ulfuk Africa appears to be emerging from the peak of its fourth pandemic wave Vaccination, which is a pivotal measure against the GIFS virus, remain far too low. About 50% of the world population is now fully vaccinated. In Africa, this is just 10%. The French Senate approved the government's latest measures to tackle the COVID-19 virus on Thursday, including a vaccine pass to access public places. The Senate backed the measures and legislation for a vaccine pass by 249 in favour versus 63 against. The legislation had already been approved earlier this month by France's lower house of parliament. The moves had encountered some opposition among the public after President Emmanuel Macron's harsh criticism of the unvaccinated. The head of state and members of his ruling party have stepped up their campaign this year against those who have not been vaccinated against COVID-19 as the country battles a fifth wave of the virus. On Wednesday, France registered more than 300,000 new COVID-19 cases in 24 hours and a further 246 deaths in hospitals. French teachers launched nationwide strike action on Thursday over the government's chaotic virus strategy for schools. Teachers' unions and school staff demanded clarity from the government on coronavirus measures. The strike comes as France's presidential election campaign gets underway ahead of an April vote. The walkout is awkward for President Emmanuel Macron's government, which has prided itself on keeping schools open to ease pressure on parents throughout the pandemic. Tens of thousands of students are out sick with COVID-19, while the protocols to be implemented in schools have changed several times, sparking confusion. Teachers denounce a lack of personal protective equipment, such as face masks. The Education Ministry reported that almost 40% of primary school teachers had walked out, while the country's top sector union put the figure at 75%, with one primary school in two closed for the day. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Kazakhstan's National Security Committee announced the end of the anti-terrorist operation launched in 14 of the country's 17 regions amid violent destabilization attempts. The red terrorist threat level was lifted as the situation stabilized. However, a limited operation continues in Almaty, the largest city of the country, and where the most serious violence occurred, and in Shambil, where measures are being taken to establish and arrest those involved in acts of terrorism and other criminal activities during the disturbances. President Kasim Jomak Tokayev also announced the start of the gradual withdrawal of peacekeeping troops from the Collective Security Treaty Organization. The peacekeeping operation to provide assistance to the fraternal nation of Kazakhstan is successfully completed. The objectives of the joint CSTO contingent forces have been accomplished. Soldiers standing in a joint formation shoulder to shoulder stood up for the defense of the fraternal Kazakh people, not allowing criminal and terrorist groups to encroach on the constitutional order and integrity of Kazakhstan. In a short period of time, you were able to guarantee citizen security provide assistance for stabilizing the situation and guaranteeing the smooth functioning of vital sites. 
And as the peacekeeping troops began withdrawing from Kazakhstan, President Vladimir Putin highlighted the importance of what the CSTO forces had accomplished. The fact that with the help of the CSTO forces, it has been possible to restore the law and the order, it is very important. In fact, this is the first such operation by the CSTO forces. Together, we have completed a very important task. This will allow the leadership of the Republic of Kazakhstan to resolve issues of socio-economic and political nature in a free, calm mode, in a dialogue with society. It is very important. A third round of talks in Europe in a week aimed at diffusing tensions between Russia and the West appear to have ended in deadlock. The meeting of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Vienna this Thursday saw the United States remain firm in its refusal to consider the security guarantees that Russia is seeking. Russia's permanent representative to the organization, Alexander Lukashevich, stated that Moscow was committed to peace and urged member states to abandon the faulty and dangerous logic of considering Russia an adversary. He pointed out that Russia's demands in the field of security match the principle, which was more than once confirmed in OSCE documents, that no country shall strengthen its security to the detriment of the security of other states. And in choosing the methods of maintaining their security, countries shall respect the legitimate concerns of others. This year's first meeting of the organization's permanent council was held under Poland's chairmanship. Unfortunately, we did not hear an adequate answer or any reaction to our proposal from our partners. Everything revolved around their concerns, the allegedly aggressive behavior of Russia, especially in the context of Ukraine events. NATO not only creates military threats, it also moves the dividing lines along with its deployment. Naturally, regarding this expansion, the Russian Federation's feeling of concern is growing, and we believe that further expansion must be stopped unconditionally. Sudanese security forces fired tear gas on Thursday at thousands of protesters marching on the presidential palace in Khartoum in fresh protests against military rule. The rally, which converged from several parts of the capital, came amid support for a United Nations bid to facilitate talks between rival Sudanese factions. The push was aimed at resolving the crisis sparked by the October 25th military coup. Security forces fired volleys of tear gas to disperse the protesters in Khartoum and its sister city of Omdurman. Pro-democracy activists have organized regular demonstrations against the military takeover, which derailed a transition to civilian rule. The United Nations called Thursday on Mali's ruling military junta to announce an election timetable amid anger over its suggestion of staying in power for five years before holding a vote. I hope to be able to make brief contact with the Malian government. I believe it is absolutely essential that the Malian government present an acceptable timetable for the elections. In Ecuador, at least four fire departments are working to extinguish a large forest fire in the coastal province of Manabi. Regional authorities stated that the blaze was reported on Wednesday, and by midnight it was 85% controlled. Firefighters from several neighboring areas have joined the efforts. Local media reported that the fire spread after the burning of an area used for agriculture. Meanwhile, the local authorities warned of the possible damage to flora and fauna. Young activists of the Fridays for Future movement gathered in front of the European Commission on Thursday to denounce a proposal that envisages classifying nuclear and fossil gas as green energies. The European Commission had planned to present its list of green energy sources in January. The list, known as the EU's taxonomy, will determine what sources are seen as sustainable and therefore eligible for investment under rules promoting a 27-nation bloc shift to a carbon-neutral future. It was meant to have been launched before the end of this year, but deep divisions between member states over including nuclear and natural gas have held the process up. France has been pushing for nuclear energy to be included, along with around a dozen other countries, but they face opposition from Austria, Germany and Luxembourg. The goal is really to tell the Commission that we do not want this poison gift, this false green gift. The Commission, in its taxonomy text, which aimed to list what should be considered as green activities, included nuclear and fossil gas. However, nuclear power and fossil gas are absolutely not green energies, and we are here to remind it. 
And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many of our stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.